And you're on. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining the, the small but friendly and I, I hope quite productive event. So let me make it full screen so I see you, every one of you joined the event. So uh, we also have a live stream for the first part. So uh, hello, everyone, to you know, who joined us via social network or any other platform where the link is available. Uh, yeah, so um, thanks a lot for the interest. So basically, our today's topic is HIV AIDS prevention using digital tools. And we'll be having two parts of the event. The first part is the lectures from uh, different stakeholders involved directly or indirectly in the process. And the second part will be the brainstorming workshop where the participants will be will be split into groups and we'll have ideation. We'll work with the, with the mentors actually and uh, with uh, some of the speakers to, uh, to create novel ideas, how we can tackle the challenges both out outlined during the presentations or, you know, created during the brainstorming workshop eventually. So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, before, before, we start, before we start with the lecture part, I would uh, really like to give uh, a word to U.S. Embassy in Riga. So uh, both Shayla and uh, Alina. So, uh, yeah, so the floor is yours, please. Oh, hold on, my audio here. Oh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Sorry, I know it looks like I still might appear as Nina Shamber on the screen, but my name is Sheila Shamber, and I'm the uh, health policy officer at the U.S. Embassy here in Riga. And I just wanted to start by saying thank you for everyone's participation today. Thank you to the DF Lab and the university for hosting the event and to uh, Aya and Inga for sharing what they know about HIV AIDS management and prevention. Um, in the 40 years since the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention published reports of what came to be known as HIV AIDS, scientific understanding has advanced, but there's still almost 38 million people around the world living with HIV, and a lot of those people don't have access to prevention, care, or treatment, and unfortunately, there's still no cure. Um, a year and a half ago, Latvia implemented a treat-all approach, offering treatment to anyone who tests positive for the virus and Latvian NGOs work really hard to support people living with HIV, but there are still challenges, including overcoming stereotypes and stigma and encouraging people to get tested and for HIV positive people to start and to stay on treatment. Um, and we think that more sexual health education for young people in Latvia could also help. We think this workshop is, is a great initiative. Um, we hope to see some great ideas to support the HIV AIDS community come out of it. And we hope that uh, we all learn something new today and that everyone enjoys the workshop. Perfect, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Shayla. Thanks a lot to US Embassy in Riga. So both for you know bringing this idea of actually uh, doing such event and also moving towards you know involving different different uh, stakeholders and also students with different from different faculties and different competences to to work together because this is this this challenge should be tackled by you know interdisciplinary approach only thanks a lot so we also have a professor leo slavo from uh faculty of computing university of latvia so well uh, we thanks a lot for joining us and uh professor will also be giving opening words and remarks from uh, from university side so the floor is yours yeah <laughs> Thanks. So, dear participants of the workshop, um, I think we know that great works need a fertile environment. And I'm happy to see that DF Lab and the University of Latvia, where we are now, although uh, <laughs> remotely, except for Emils, I can see, um, is providing such an environment for projects such as the one that's taking place today. Um, however, besides the environment, Another aspect is to facilitate collaboration between different disciplines, right? such as the computer science and medical sciences. And I can also see that this is happening in a lab, not just today, but also in the past. And this is just one another event. So this is good so that we can pursue the meaningful solutions for the challenging problems of today's world. And as we see, one such problem is HIV right? and AIDS, right? So 
but thankfully also to this modern world comes with powerful tools and opportunities such as the digital health interventions and other things that you're going to be talking about so today we will work on making more of those digital remedies known and available to the people living with or without hiv so i welcome the participants of this workshop and wish you a productive event just one more thing in order to make these things happen, we need all kinds of support. And in this case, I would like to welcome and thank the Embassy of the United States for supporting such a good cause and being here with us. So thank you. Be smart. Be productive. Thank you so much, Professor. I think uh, the, this words will motivate the participants and not only the participants of the event, but also the, the viewers who happened to, to join us to the live stream. So I, this is not, you know, the, this event is just a start. So uh, let's see what we'll get out of that in the end of the event. And uh, we really hope that also people watching us or listening to us through audio channels will, uh, will also be joining us to this discussion further on. Thanks a lot. So uh, yeah, so uh, we will give a quick, quick, quick opening words from the DF labs, basically from a physical facility I happen to be now and also Kaspers in the other room, uh, in the studio room. <laughs> um, yeah, Kasper, I think you can give me uh, a right to, to share the screen and then we can, I can give a couple of slides and also put the agenda on, uh, on top of that. Yeah. So for all I know, you are free to share right at this moment. Okay. Let me, uh -huh. let me do like that. Interesting. So uh, yeah, so once again, you know, technical people got technical problems. <laughs> so uh, let me do like that. And uh, quickly, give me just, just one second, please. Mm -hmm. Technical people get technical problems. <laughs> so uh, hello everyone once again. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, you, uh, before the event, we tested tested out this with the uh, with the lecturers, but never tested out by ourselves. So which is, you know, as always happening there. So um, let me quickly share the screen, and you will see it here. So yeah, I think uh, let me do like that and do the slideshow. On. Bam. Yeah, so uh, the, the place we are physically located in and also, you know, virtually hosting from is called DF Lab. So basically, uh, um, as, as Professor outlined already, so basically our, our main goal is to connect uh, computer science uh, students from, from Faculty of Computing, Faculty of uh, Medicine and other related life science and also uh, other, other specialities and other faculties all together to create an environment for sharing ideas sharing competences in order to um, create solutions for problem solving, in this case, for healthcare. So uh, yeah, we all started you know, with a room like that, but ending up with a room like that, a little bit more messy now, but nevertheless. So the same thing happens here. So uh, you know, we, we are basically um, uh, tackling not only the students or professional, but also youngsters. So this is one of the, one of the TV shows that we uh, made. Uh, in collaboration with the uh, with the magazine ear and, uh, and other involved stakeholders to learn a little bit of more of a hands-on approach how to use tech for the everyday problem solving you know as a screwdriver and ending up with the healthcare uh, medical students sitting up here and you know making some some stuff with a Arduino with a with a small microcontroller with a small computers with the sensor nodes all together to create wearable device prototypes or any other you know sensing system that can sense the temperature or other signs and um, do clever stuff and, and do some output for us automatically. So um, in order to start with education concepts, so basically why we're doing this as a part of a, uh, this workshop, the bigger vision is basically we're launching uh, an approach to uh, for the medical and life science students to, to have a hands-on approach for introduction to technologies, um, which will be a lecture course, kind of 
basically involving both the theoretical aspects of the of the computer science and the tech, but also giving up the hands-on experience with the practical workshops, how to use, you know, different tech that we see in, in the Black Mirror episodes or, you know, outside outside of, the, of this room in everyday life, how we can use them for the problem solving in, in the healthcare space. And uh, the main concept is basically so-called mixer event. This will also happen in a small scale today, which basically, you know, throwing all the competence all together and turning on the mixer to create a very good uh, power shake. So, uh, you know, uh, having both the technical competence and, uh, and life science competence, design, business, marketing competence all together to make to make the thing happen. But nevertheless, so let, let's move forward with the, to the agenda. Um, so the agenda for today is the following. So we already are finishing the first one, the introductory words. So we'll start with the with the Aya Wilde from uh, giving us the perspective from a, from the, the medical perspective on HIV AIDS and the challenges, uh, and passing over to to Inga Alpmatze, and uh, then having a tech topic all together, and then we'll have a workshop begin. So yeah, so we, we, with this, I will uh, stop my screen sharing and uh, give a give a floor to Aya to give us uh, an, introductory, an introductory lecture on medical perspective for, for such disease. Thank you, Aya. You're welcome. Here. Uh, hello. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, actually, the most important challenges already was, were uh, stressed out in the introductory part. But uh, OK, um, I decided to, uh, because uh, as I understand that most of uh, participants and attendees are uh, not clinicians and not, uh, are not doctors. So uh, to better understand the, the challenges, I will uh, deliver brief, uh, brief uh, background on HIV infection development and uh, treatment development. Uh, if you have any questions at any point of my presentation, please feel free to interrupt and uh, and and ask. Um, from the beginning, so um, HIV is a virus, um, which uh, after uh, infecting the person enters uh, the cells, and it targets CD4 cells, which are responsible for our uh, immunity and the immune system, and actually they are fighters against uh, other infections. And the process is that HIV uh, virus uh, goes into the cell, then uses the cell's uh, resources and then bounds out uh, uh, from the cell. And as you can see in the uh, corner, those red dots are viruses. So from each cell comes out lots of lots of viruses. And at the one point when um, resources are empty, the cell dies. And then after all those uh, new viruses go to in other tails, cells and over years, the number of uh, CD4 cells drops down. And of course, the number of uh, viruses uh, goes out uh, up. And uh, when the CD4 count drops below 200, normal amount of CD4 would be above 700 cells. Uh, so when it drops below 200, then person with HIV starts to have opportunistic infection as uh, tuberculosis, uh, fungal infections, uh, other viral infections uh, which can cause death. And uh, it was told there is no cure, and it's true. Uh, we can only treat uh, HIV infection, but actually there are two patients uh, who are cured. One was uh, in uh, Berlin and one in uh, in London, uh, but um, it was uh, the, these were patients who had uh, um, oncology, and uh, they received uh, chemotherapy and bone marrow transplantation, and uh, and then they were cured uh, from HIV. But as you understand, it's not a, a possibility worldwide um, a method of treatment because it goes with high risks. So no cure till now. And uh, of course, the number, although the number of uh, HIV, people living with HIV increases, uh, the, the good thing is that the trend of a uh, number of newly infected, uh, who are newly infected with HIV goes down. And the same trend uh, we observe uh, uh, in uh, AIDS. Uh, AIDS is uh, when the person has uh, all those opportunistic infections and uh, or when uh, the CD4 count is below 200. So then we say it's AIDS condition. 
and uh, of course number of uh, people who receive antiretroviral therapy uh, uh, is uh, growing and of course we can uh, see this connection the more people receive uh, antiretroviral therapy the the, the more um, uh, death rate goes down because of AIDS and um, a little bit also to understand the nowadays challenges and uh, this uh, treatment uh, uh, questions uh, regarding treatment and stigma, I just will uh, um, in, uh, show you a little bit of history. So uh, antiretroviral therapy was uh, introduced in 90s and the uh, first uh, drugs um, called, were quite toxic and uh, and uh, could cause some toxic uh, adverse events and also there were monotherapy, there were no um, many drugs at the same time. So now the golden uh, st uh, standard is that every patient receives at least three uh, medications from at least two different uh, drug groups. So uh, the resistance don't develop. Resistance means that those drugs don't work uh, against HIV anymore. So if you give only one uh, drug, uh, the resistance develops. So at the beginning, um, everyone was treated uh, with those antiretroviral therapy in the 90s, but because of those toxic uh, events and uh, development of resistance, um, uh, it was decided to initiate antiretroviral therapy only when CD4 count drops below 200. So this is a risk when uh, opportunistic infections could, uh, could uh, develop. And that was the most important uh, aim at that time. And, uh, but over the years uh, and uh, in um, uh, publications and research studies, it was observed that uh, actually opportunistic infections are not the only, uh, only threat to HIV patients and uh, that uh, also uh, they die from other causes such as uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, oncologic diseases. And, um, and if comparing with uh, general population, you can see that uh, in HIV patients, the risk of uh, myocardial infarction is higher. And this is uh, because uh, HIV uh, causes not only suppression of our immune system, but uh, it is discovered that actually HIV causes also uh, inflammation in our organism. Uh, and this happens in uh, other viruses or bacteria as well. Uh, for example, flu, and this inflammation causes changes in blood vessels and uh, in uh, uh, other systems. It also can damage uh, uh, kidneys and the neural, uh, neural system. So um, this is a reason why uh, HIV patients also has higher risk of other comorbidities and also they have a higher rate of uh, osteoporosis. So the inflammation is other thing which is very important um, uh, in the care of HIV uh, patients, and uh, these are guidelines. Uh, European AIDS Clinical of a, a European AIDS Clinical Society they update it every year, and the last, this is the last version. And as you can see, that uh, in those patients, uh, many organ systems are um, are um, um, are damaged and. Uh, as I already told, the uh, cardiovascular system, renal system, uh, neural system, uh, sexual dysfunction. So um, those are all the problems uh, HIV patients face uh, in every day. And uh, that is also the reason why we should start uh, uh, treatment early. And, um, and uh, the, another, another reason is that uh, the sooner you start treatment, the better is prognosis for the, the first person living with HIV. And uh, this uh, purple line uh, illustrates that uh, 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 if you start CD4 uh, treatment when CD4 count is below 140, the uh, uh, risk of dying, probability of dying is uh, very, very high. So the sooner you start, uh, the better. And uh, actually, the, already in 2013, it was uh, clear that if you start treatment when CD4 count is uh, above 500, actually the, the life expectancy for HIP people are as in general population.
and also that uh, if you start when the CD4 count is above 500, uh, it is possible also to completely suppress this uh, inflammation. If you start uh, later, then it's impossible to fully suppress uh, inflammation and uh, reach uh, the normal value, uh, count of CD4 cells. So uh, one aspect of uh, treat treatment, uh, early treatment is uh, to uh, 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 in the benefit of the person, but also it's very important for preventing uh, others uh, from in uh, from uh, transmission of HIV, because uh, if the person receives antiretroviral therapy, uh, viral load and uh, uh, it is uh, suppressed, and there are no uh, virus circulating in blood and uh, semen, and uh, the person cannot infect others. So, uh, other aspect is treatment as prevention, and that is the reason why already. Um, years ago, it was decided that actually we still need to treat uh, everyone and not wait uh, 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 for a CD4 count drop uh, below 340 or below 500. So uh, since uh, 2017, there are recommend only one recommendation when to initiate uh, uh, antiretroviral therapy and it's uh, at the time of diagnosis. Everything would be very nice. Uh, we treat everyone. Everyone uh, uh, has a good uh, life quality. Uh, infection doesn't spread. Only problem is that actually we don't diagnose it. And this is the first challenge uh, that uh, half of the patients who are diagnosed are diagnosed late. Uh, late means that they CD4, their CD4 count is below 350. And the highest risk is uh, if the person is uh, at age above 50 or, and also for heterosexual men and women. And uh, this is due to stigmatization, this above 50. Um, and because everyone thinks that it's only new people, uh, young people uh, problem. And, uh, and in Latvia, uh, it's... Uh, more than 50% 50, 50 are diagnosed uh, as well late. And uh, this is because uh, one uh, usually people go to see doctors when they have different uh, conditions and illnesses. The problem is that um, doctors don't recognize those conditions. And already in 2013, there are uh, guidelines, uh, HIV indicator condition guided HIV testing it means that um, I put only part of those recommendations. That it means that uh, if you have a patient with uh, one of those conditions and you will test everyone, you will get more than 0 0.1 uh, positive result. So it, uh, there are such conditions as pneumonia or uh, or unexplained fever or uh, or um, or severe psoriasis. And in all those conditions, uh, uh, it would be strongly recommended, and actually it would be obligatory to perform also HIV tests because HIV people, people with HIV, they have those conditions more often. Um, and also there are uh, C, AIDS category diseases, and etc. Only doctors don't prescribe HIV tests, don't offer HIV tests. And uh, it is also based on lack of knowledge and uh, because of stigmatization. Uh, I know that now uh, uh, they are working on the uh, updated version of those indicator conditions. And, uh, and uh, because we don't diagnose, uh, uh, we, um, and uh, also we didn't treat uh, timely our patients, uh, we have a high rate of new HIV diagnosis. And this is a second challenge. So testing is second challenge. And um, this is uh, why we have this such a high rate in Latvia of new new cases is that, uh, as it was mentioned previously, uh, actually we started to treat everyone only since 2018. And uh, I put a, a table where you can see that uh, in 2014, uh, it's only five years ago, Latvia was the only country in, in Europe where uh, we still waited uh, while CD4 will drop below 200. So even if we would 
uh, diagnose timely, timely means so above 350 cells, we wouldn't treat, so it's uh, uh, crazy. Uh, but uh, since 2018, so we treat everyone. And the goal uh, is uh, a worldwide goal uh, uh, regarding HIV is 1990 target. So it means that 90% of people uh, who have HIV knows that they have, so they are tested. 90% of those who have HIV receives antiretroviral treatment, and at least 90% who re receives antiretroviral treatment, uh, uh, for them viral load, uh, viral, viral load is suppressed, so virus is suppressed and it's effective. And of course, uh, but of course this coverage is not uh, uh, homogeneous, it differs in different parts of the world, and um, the other and uh, other challenges that uh, actually when uh, people start to receive uh, those medications they not always uh, use them regularly on daily basis and uh, sometimes they drop uh, out of uh, treatment and um, in uh, latvia they are very old data i couldn't uh, find official more um, and uh, up to date, but uh, at that time, 2011, there were only 42% of all people who initiated antiretroviral treatment. They still continued it after uh, one year. Um, I spoke with uh, colleagues so, uh, who work in the Infectology Center of Latvia. They uh, uh, so this uh, com uh, lack of compliance is still uh, quite high. Uh, in in uh, our HIV population, so uh, that would be a brief uh, overview. And um, I was thinking on challenges. So um, to sum up, uh, I think that uh, uh, one ch first challenge would be that uh, we don't diagnose timely HIV infection. Uh, the second one is this compliance problem when patient is diagnosed that uh, they uh, sometimes they don't comply with treatment tests and etc. And third is education. Uh, education also for teenagers for uh, pupil um, uh, on uh, on uh, health education and uh, HIV and sexually trans transmittable diseases. And I also thought of uh, possible solutions. So uh, 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 maybe Inga can also later comment on that. I know that uh, NGOs they go uh, to schools and um, they play games with uh, with uh, with uh, children, with teenagers. And uh, actually, there could be an application for teens when, uh, where you can uh, gain information on HIV, on testing, on uh, on uh, safe sex, uh, and uh, also. Uh, play some games or something, uh, it would be one solution. Um, second, uh, uh, about um, compliance. Um, patients, they have to, they are obliged to come uh, and see doctor at, uh, at the beginning more often, uh, but if everything is all right, usually once in three months, uh, because uh, uh, medication can be prescribed uh, just for three months, uh, no longer. So every three months they have to come and sometimes they uh, forget that they have to make an appointment and uh, sometimes they forget to take uh, uh, medication on daily basis. Sometimes they have questions on uh, interaction with other drugs. Um, sometimes they also uh, go, for example, from Riga to another uh, part of Latvia and they can forget these drugs and then it would be really nice that actually they can uh, see in this app, their app as uh, the closest places where, and closest available doctor and locations of outpatient department for HIV patients and uh, so and uh, and uh, also uh, also but it's uh, just my uh, mm, dream that uh, maybe it could be integrated with e-health so actually the patient can see also his uh, uh, lab tests and prescribed medications and and and, and etc so it would uh, help for patients to uh, increase uh, compliance uh, with treatment and uh, the third solution for for uh, for testing uh, 
it would be good uh, to be aimed uh, on uh, two populations, one for, pa for people, for patients and one for medics. Uh, I was thinking that uh, I don't know how we can reach medics, <laughs> maybe some campaign, uh, informative campaign, but uh, for patients, for person, I know maybe that there is also some algorithm or something or app or I don't know, where uh, if the patient is tested positive, again, uh, he already can see uh, uh, what to do, where to call, where to go, how to make an appointment. So it would be more easy for 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 them to reach uh, the doctor and uh, medicine help uh, regarding HIV. So this is um, uh, all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aya. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, so uh, please questions. So we'll be having questions. So I wrote down a couple of questions coming from uh, from Facebook feed. But uh, any anyone who is on a on a Zoom call <laughs> joined to us has any questions to to Aya or you know any related topic she was presenting. Okay, so uh, I can start. <laughs> Sorry, I just I had one quick question. Ah, Sorry, sure. just waiting to see if anybody else would jump in. Sure. Aya, thank you so much for your presentation. I thought it was it was so good. Um, but as you were talking at the end about some possible solutions um, and talking about an app, maybe to let patients know where to find the closest HIV treatment outside of Riga, I just wondered if you know. Um, is there a lack of that information now? Do people not know where to go if they're not in in the city? Uh, they they know uh, for the local one, for example, if they live in the countryside, they know uh, where's the closest and they can uh, go there. The problem is sometimes that uh, they do not want to go to the local one because, uh, and also they do not want to go to local pharmacy because they are afraid that then uh, the, everyone will will know that they have HIV and they are afraid of that, and that's why sometimes even they prefer to go from countryside two, three kilometers away to come to Riga. Mm. And uh, sometimes it's expensive and they don't have money. That's why they also drop out of treatment. And But sometimes there can be a situation, as I told, that, for example, person goes on a vacation, for example, and forgets uh, medicine at home. So, uh, of course, he doesn't know where is the closest one because he always mm -hmm. goes to his uh, outpatient department, for example, in Riga. And then uh, he needs to return back uh, to, to the city or, or something. Uh, it would be, uh, I talk to patients and, uh, and, uh, and colleagues uh, and uh, they, uh, we, yeah, they pointed out that it would be helpful. Yeah, I guess I wonder if even going from your own hometown to a nearby town might give you greater anonymity if you wanted to go see a doctor, mm. you know, that not as far away as Riga, but far away enough from your home community that you wouldn't have to worry about um, the stigma or the stereotyping. Yeah, thank you again. Thank, thank you. you, Sheila, for the question. Thank you, Aya. Uh, any more questions coming from, uh, from, uh, from the audience of Zoom? Okay, so you'll have also an opportunity to ask questions. So I will uh, quickly elaborate on the one coming from Facebook. So uh, I wrote this down here. So um, as you outlined in the presentation, so basically one of the key phrases and lessons learned was the sooner you start the treatment, the better it is. So um, basically the, the question was, what are the challenges for, you know, for the diagnostics? I think you already answered to that, but I, I, I will add to that, you know, the, the second part, which is the second stakeholder, which are doctors. So uh, you, you told the doctors or general practitioners in this case do not recognize the conditions that are uh, extremely important for the patients to be, to be tested for HIV further. So uh, how do you think, how, how this can be changed? Is it, you know, is it the problem of proactivity of patients or it should be, the doctors should be tackled, you know, with a very strict protocol, how you know, how do the triage or decision making, or uh, how do you envision this? How we can solve it? Um, uh, I think only um, to providing information to societies of uh, general practitioners, but not only to general practitioners. Also, it uh, uh, concerns uh, specialists as well. For example, because. Um, I don't know how to reach other uh, uh, 
associations. For example, in uh, my hospital where I work in Faust Radnich Clinical University Hospital, we provide those guidelines, we remind of those recommendations, but still we have some air, uh, departments where they are doing remarkably. And uh, for example, in pneumonology, for example, a few years ago, uh, there were few patients who were tested on HIV with, uh, if they had pneumonia. Now you cannot find anyone uh, without, with, uh, who is not tested for HIV. So we test everyone with, with pneumonia, for example. But uh, still, uh, and, and sometimes uh, uh, I think also for general practitioners, it's uh, harder because uh, of this stigmatization and also they don't know how to ask uh, to for the patient because lots of uh, many patients also uh, consider that uh, if they are uh, um, advised to perform HIV tests that the doctor thinks that they are uh, uh, drug users or um, have multiple sexual partners they still has this stigma now, in my personal uh, experience, I also work in the outpatient department with all kinds of uh, patients, not HIV, just HIV, all kinds. I offer to patients with hepatitis C or uh, unexplained fever. Actually, basically, actually, I uh, offer it to everyone who is not uh, tested because it's a general recommendation. If you never received HIV test, you should receive it uh, in regards of your condition. And I didn't have any patient who would be um, uh, who would not be happy or to perform this and uh, so I, I never faced this problem but I can imagine that it can can appear yeah thank you Aya so a couple of more questions and I will pass the word to to the audience once again so uh, you you mentioned about stigmatization and I think this is one of the core challenges that we need to tackle in uh, in regards to this topic but uh, can you you know since we have uh, also the live uh, the live stream and uh, people from different age groups and different gender groups also are watching us so uh, you you mentioned that it's not only you know the stereotype is that it's, it's all uh, HIV is only uh, high, has only high prevalence among young people. This is one of the stereotypes there. Can you elaborate on this? So th this is this is not only young people problem. Am I right? Just you know for yes. everyone. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I didn't show you this uh, distribution among um, different age groups, but uh, actually now uh, this uh, the most people are uh, in age group above age of forty. Uh, this uh, prevalence is changed and uh, the stigmatization is uh, uh, because of the how uh, this uh, uh, infection uh, looked when it started and it was in 80s that's why and we cannot get uh, off uh, all those uh, stigmas uh, but yes uh, nowadays it's uh, more of uh, about age 40 and uh, actually the risk is higher uh, about 50 and uh, more uh, because um, uh, and also risk of transmission is higher because one of reasons uh, why uh, why people use uh, condoms is because they don't want to prevent pregnancy but somehow they forget about uh, sexual transmitted diseases and uh, after um, Mm. And in certain age of uh, women, uh, they don't have this problem anymore. So uh, they forget about condoms. And so at this point, the uh, risk uh, uh, increases, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So any, any more questions coming from, uh, from Zoom? Um, uh, I think I would have one uh, regarding the uh, general uh, practitioners and the guidelines you have in Stradinch Hospital. So the question is, would it be good to create some kind of uh, shortlist with recommendations for the uh, general practitioners with A-level recommendation if a person, for example, has uh, unexplained fever or pneumonia, it will be an like automatic indication for GP to refer that person to HIV testing. Then it'll we could create like B-level recommendation and let the GP work from that. Does anything like that exist or it would be suitable at the moment? I, I'm, I, uh, I'm uh, not 100% sure, but uh, regarding those um, uh, recommendations I showed, it's only two pages. And uh, in uh, their homepage, uh, they are translated in almost every language of uh, every European language except Latvian. 
I think it would be very easy way uh, to just translate and uh, to spread out the information, but um, but yeah, I, the I question don't know. Is how, and how and uh, uh, our professor that. and lots of infectologists has spoken about this uh, not only once in, in uh, those uh, meetings of. Uh, uh, general practitioners, but somehow when you give this information, somehow they still for, forget about it or don't want to use it or I don't know why. So in your opinion, it should not be maybe a recommendation, but more like a strict guideline. Would that be a better option? I don't think that there is difference how we call it or strict recommendation or guideline or uh, I think that uh, somehow because the uh, in, in anyway, uh, at the end, if you don't perform this test, you don't perform, and I don't see how you can influence that uh, uh, in other way as uh, education okay. and voluntary. Uh, but yeah, I'm infectologist. I don't know on that. Yeah, thanks a lot, Aya. So uh, yeah, for for, for those, uh, thanks for the questions actually. So for those ones asking the questions, please also uh, give you know a, a word of an intro about yourself. How was your name and the way you. Where you come from, <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks a lot. In order to finish, just you know, just a quick you know, motto or a little bit of motivational phrase. So you, you told that uh, the patients uh, who are using the therapy in a, in the right way uh, can live a so-called like full life, like live the lo life at its best, or you know. So um, so can you elaborate on this? I think this is one one another one of the stigmas, you know, that uh, people with uh, HIV yeah. are you know some kind of a you know people that are not in the society and they cannot yes. not live the life. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Uh, I also remember from my uh, school time, uh, we, I was shown a cartoon of a young uh, boy who got infected and died very soon in very drastic death. Uh, but nowadays, uh, it's um, uh, now uh, recent publications even say that people with HIV live longer than the general population. And the reason is because they have this good health care uh, and they uh, uh, can prevent all the other risks. So actually they live longer. And um, yeah, so it's uh, the most important thing is to be tested and uh, to go and have this uh, care and uh, then a person can live normal life yeah so uh yeah thanks a lot so i think let's finish the talk with this positive note that we should proactively be monitoring our healthcare state uh not not only you know for uh, positive diseases but also uh, for preventive matters thanks a lot Aya, once again okay. uh yeah so i'll give a word to to inga Ukmatsu now so uh seiki of the end of the end yeah that yeah isla sauskanyo do dvardims Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my presentation will be in Latvian, uh, but I can switch, of course, for questions to English. And uh, thank you, Aya, for very good uh, introduction, introduction of uh, situation with HIV in Latvia, because uh, my presentation actually will have a lot of pictures and also uh, I will talk uh, the same questions, but uh, in in an other records. So, what what's about will be my presentation about uh, how how people are getting infected in Latvia and also in Europe. I also will show some pictures what are similar or a little bit similar to IS pictures, uh, but then. I will have uh, our uh, new product. Product we, uh, as every year we can we comparing uh, data uh, from Baltic states and also now we have this uh, this results of this comparing and I will show you what uh, what is situation in Latvia, in Lithuania, and in uh, Estonia. 
and in uh, in the uh, last or in the yeah third part of my presentation i will talk about ngo's role what we are doing what are other institution organizations doing in latvia and uh, uh, what we can do more Tālāk es pāriešu latviešu valodā pavisam tādas nelielas patiesības par HIV, tātad HIV ir cilvēku imūna deficīta vīrus, ir divi viņa tipi, un šis ir lēns vīrus, kas dzīvo tikai cilvēka organismā un spējīgs vairoties un izraisīt šoti saslimšanu. Aic stadī vienkāršā valodā runājot ir HIV infekcijas beigus stadija, bet kā jau vajag norādīt, tas ir pie nosacījuma, ja cilvēks nesaņem medikamentus. Tātad tiek pievienojas dažādas HIV, izraisīt, HIV izraisītā imūna deficīta apstākļos dažādas slimības, audzēji un, un citas saslimšanas. Un ja runā par to, kā HIV izplatās, tā tad pavisam atkal vienkārši ābec ir trijos veidos. Tas notiek, kon, tas notiek tā tad sākšu ar, ar otru galu, ar mātes pienu no inficētas grūtniecas bērniņš inficēs. Diemžēl mums joprojām Latvijā ir šādi atsevišķi gadījumi katru gadu, kas ir pretēji Igaunijai un Lietuvai. Seksālie kontakti. Un asins kontakti, tātad asinis, dzimuma orgāna šķidrumi un mātes pienas ir tie trīs veidi un vienīgie trīs veidi, kas var inficēt kādā veidā, var cilvēks inficēties no otra cilvēka, kurš ir HIV inficēts. Eksistē daudz mīti un, un par inficēšanās iespējām ar HIV to starpā. Tātad, ka cilvēki inficējas vienkārši sarokojoties, skulpstoties, lietojot kopējos traukus vai sadzīves priekšmetus, šķaudot, piemēram, Covid laiks šobrīd, kur, kur arī paralēls mītos varētu vilkt ar insektu kodumiem, tātad joprojām cilvēki atzīst, ka var inficēties no odu kodumiem, un šie viss ir nepareizās atbildes par ko arī mēs ļoti cenšamies dažādās apmācībās un tiekoties ar, ar auditorijām runāt, ka šādi inficēties ar HIV nevar. Par riskiem ir dažādi riski, tā tad caur veselu ādu neinficē, neinficē no HIV inficēta cilvēka, caur gļotādām nu, risks ir ļoti, ļoti neliels, Ādas ievainojumi pēc adatas dūrieni jau redzat 0,33%, bet risks tiešām ir reāls un ļoti liels, pārlijot inficētas asins. Vai jāatzīmē, ka Latvijā šādas tiešās asins pārliešanas nav, arī šādi gadījumi nav konstatētu, bet, piemēram, Rumānija pirms 20 gadiem piedzīvoja ļoti traģisku periodu, kad bērnu namos bija viena no metodēm izvēlēt asins pārliešanu, nu, lai tā kā uzlabot šo bērnu e, imunitātu, un tas noveda pie ļoti daudz inficēšanās gadījumiem bērniem, kas joprojām ir problēma Rumānijā. Ja runā par seksuālo kontaktu ceļu un par riskiem, nu, tad riski ir, tā tad vislielākais risks ir anālais seks, ko... E, Pārsarā piekopi tātad homoseksuālu vīriešu, tāpēc arī šie homoseksuālie vīriešu pasaulē un arī Eiropā šobrīd nu, ir viena no šīm te visvairāk ar HIV, pakļaut, HIV inficēšanās riskam pakļautajām grupām. Vaginālam seksam tātad arī, kontakt, arī šis risks pastāv augsts un zemāks tas ir orāliem seksam līdz pat teksim arī pavisam niecīgam. Ja tā pavisam vienkārši saveido šo te infekcijas attīstības stadijas, tātad pie perioda, pie noteikuma, ka cilvēks nesaņem zāles pret HIV, tad mēs varētu viņu sadalīt tādos trijos periodos no inficēšanās brīža. Viens, varētu, viens ir šis loga periods, 
kurš ir ļoti, ļoti infekcijos, jo viņš ilgst nepilnu vienu mēnesi, asinīs ir ļoti daudz vīrusu, bet antivielas vēl nav izstrādājušās. Un literatūrā ir dažādi dati, ir, ka šāda, teiksim, šajā laikā var veidoties, tātad var, var pievienoties nu, tā saucamā akūtā HIV infekcijas simptomātika, kas ir nu, līdzīgi gripai, un literatūrā ir dati, ka tas mēdz būt nu, sākot no 30% līdz pat 80%. Varbūt kā IA, kā praktikim, ir, ir savi, savi komentāri par šo biežumu. Taču tātad šādi tā kā gripas simptomi vai infekciozās mononukleozas simptomi, šie te varbūt arī pavirdienas un ārstam motivāciju cilvēku izmeklēt arī uz HIV, par ko arī iepriekš šā irunāja. Tad ir latentais periods, nu, kas ir bezsimptoma periods, un cilvēks ļoti ilgi var dzīvot vidēji 10 gadus plus mīnus ar HIV infekciju, nezinot, ka viņš nav inficējies. Tādēļ mūsu rekomendācija noteikti kaut reizi gadā veikt šo HIV testu. Un viss beidzot aids, kas jau ir šī te imūnās sistēmas sagrāvi un kuras laikā pievienojas dažādas citas saslimšanas. Šis jau attēls bija, ai es nekomentēšu vairāk, bet stāsti par to, ka vīrus savairojas cilvēku organismā, paiet gadi, ja, ārst, ja zāles nesiņem, tad tā tad beigās ir aids stadija ar daudz vīrusiem un maz cilvēku imūnās sistēmas sēdē četri šūnām. Par izplatību. Varbūt atkal līdzīgi AIS attēliem nedaudz jaunāka, bet tā, nu, situācija tāda pati šajā te attēlā par HIV Eiropā jau ir uh, Igaunijas un uh, Latvijas krāsas vienādu blīvumu, un šajos gados arī bija tas laiks, kad Latvija apsteidz Igauniju tieši izplatības ziņā uz 100 tūkstoši iedzīvotājiem. Par aidi runājot, Latvija joprojām pirmā vietā, šeit esam viss sliktākajā pozīcijā, gan dēļ šajām vēlajām diagnozēm, gan arī dēļ mūsu ārstēšanas atpalicības gadu, teiksim, pāris gadu līmenī no pārējām Eiropas valstīm. Un tagad par šīm te mūsu teiksim, iegūtījiem datiem, ko mēs kā Baltijas Kīva asociācijā katru gadu publicējam savā mājas lapā un drīz arī tie būs pieejami. Tātad līdz 19. gadu 31. decembrim gandrīz 8 tūkstoši kopā gadījumu, HIV gadījumu reģistrēt Latvijā 1. 1987. gadā. Tātad šī līkne ir augšu pejoša, protams, ir no viņas apmēram 2000 cilvēku vairs šobrīd nav dzīvojos, ir miruši, tātad dzīvo skaits ir šobrīd apmēram 6000 cilvēku. Var redzēt, ka pēdējos gados, sākot no 17. gada uz leju, mūsu jaunie gadījumi beidzot sāk mazināties. Protams, izskaidrojums tam būtu dažādu pētniecības veikšanu. Nu, šobrīd situācija izskatās nedaudz cerīgāk nekā vēl pirms pāris gadiem. Tas ir šie, šie teiksim, sadalījām visas inficēšanās gadījumas vairākās krāsās, vairākos posmos. Un var redzēt, ka Pievērsīsimies sākotnēji zaļajam, tātad tā ir heteroseksuālā transmisija starp vīrieti un sievieti inficēšanās, kas ir aizņēma tātad nu, tādu diezgan nopietnu segmentu. Ir zilajā krāsā augšā arī šī ir seksuālā transmisija, tātad ja viņas kopā saskaita, tad 42% sanāk no cilvēkiem, kas ir reģistrēti pagājušajā gadā, ir inficējušies tieši seksuāla, seksuālajā transmisijā. Šo te grafika ļoti kropļo tas, ka mums ir joprojām tikpat 42% neapzināti, nezināmi inficēšanās ceļi. 
Un kas man nedaudz izbrīnīja pagājušajā gadā, jo tieši pagājušajā gadā tika izveidots jauns HIV reģistrs, kurā vajadzētu būt, ka dati tomēr ir pilnīgāk nekā iepriekš. Šī problēma, kā redze, turpinās, un, diemžēl, viņa neļauj epidemioloģiski pareizi novērtēt situāciju. Salīdzinājums ar pārējām divām Baltijas valstīm. Zilā līkne, šeit ir tāda datēlots uz 100 tūkstoši iedzīvotājiem, un zilā līkne ir Igaunija, Sarkanā Latvija, un zaļā līkne ir Lietuva. Melnā apakšā ir Eiropas vidējie rādītāji. Nu, kā sāksim ar Eiropu, tātad Eiropā 18. gadā 5,1%. Latvijā ir bijis gads tātad 17. 19. Tas ir, cik reizes vairāk, tas ir tātad daudz reizes vairāk nekā Eiropas vidējā līmenī. Apvilku šo te šajā grafikā pēdējos gadus, jo tur var redzēt gan to, ka Igaunija, kurā 2002. gadā līdzīgi kā pirmajā gadā Latvijā un tur patās arī Igaunijā, Bija ļoti liels inficēšanās skaita pieaugums tieši dēļ narkotika lietošanas, iniciējumo narkotika lietošanas, kas izraisīja tātad šo te HIV vīrus pārnes ar asinīm. Igaunijas situācija ik gadu stabili uzlabojas. Latvijas situācija, diemžēl, tātad 17. gadā, 16. gadā, Iet virs jau Igaunijas situācijas, un tikai pēdējā divi gadi mums ir šī pozitīvā dinamika samazinās. Nedaudz savādākā rakursā šis testam trīt strateģija Latvijā un Igaunijā salīdzināja tieši šīs divas valstis, un arī šeit var redzēt, ka ir šo te divi, trīs gadu starpība tieši, uzsākot ārstēt visus cilvēkus, neskatoties uz CD4 un skaitu. Un tas arī faktiski atspogojas uz to manu iepriekš rādīto attēlu. Tātad Latvijai tikai 18. gadu 1. oktobrī ir pieejama ārstēšana visiem HIV inficētiem, neskatoties, vai tie ir... 350 vai 500 šūnas, tātad ārstēja to liņu kaut vai no tūkstotas šūnām. Par to, kāds tad ir HIV inficētā cilvēka portrets Latvijā. Salīdzinājums sākotnē ir pa šiem te vecumu gadiem, pa inficēšanās, tātad joprojām visvairāk no reģistrētie gadījumi ir vecuma grupā starp 30 un 39 gadiem. Taču te ir uzbīdījies virsū mūsu attēls, bet ja mēs varētu redzēt vēl to pēdējo stabiņu, kas ir, Tātad mēs redzam, ka pieaug aizvien šie cilvēki, kas ir tiešām vecāki cilvēki. Šis jautājums jau tika pirmajā prezentācijā. Arī tātad mēs viņam pieskārāmies ķīv infekciju noveco, respektīvi cilvēki, kas inficējas kļūst arī jau pēc 50, pēc 40 gadiem, un šis ir jāņem vērā veselības aprūpē. Ja skatās par sievietēm un vīriešiem, tad atkal šī proporcija faktiski ir nemainīga. Vīriešu ir vairāk nekā sieviešu kopumā, un vīrieši šeit ir zilijā krāsā, sievietis sarkanā atspoguļotis, un tā tad te var arī skatīties un pašā pirmajā stabiņā, tā tad pa pagājušo gadu mums ir arī divi jaunzimušie, viens puisiets, viena meitenīte, kas ir inficēta ar hīlu no savām mātiem, kam nevajadzētu būt un kam, kā es teicu, Igaunijā un Lietuvā ir panākta nulle, neviens neinficējis. Runājot par šo te problēmu, kas mums pastāv, tā tad ir bijuši gadi pat atpakaļ, kad ir bijuši deviņi, ne pat liekas, ka desmit jaunzimušie inficētie. Un kāpēc tas ir tā? Tāpēc, ka mātes, kas ir šī te bērnu lieta nēsātājs, laikus vai nu nezina par savu infekciju vai visbiežāk, tās ir no nelabēlīgām grupām, 
kur zin, ka ir HIV inficēts un nelieto medikaments. Jo, ja sieviete lieto medikamentus pret vīrus zāles, tad bērnam izredz piedzimt veselam ir tūk pie 100%. Šo es uzskatu, ka mēs varētu arī izvirzīt kā vienu no problēmām, līdz ar otru problēmu, ko iepriekš pieminēja šie cilvēki, kas ir vecāku gadu cilvēki. Narkotika lietošana joprojām ir aktuāla, bet salīdzinot ar 2000. gadu sākumu, kā redzat, nu šī te proporcionāli aktualitāte mazinās, bet tas ir noteikti arī iespaidojis. Šo faktu ir iespaidojis arī tas, ka Latvijā ir ļoti sen un ļoti labi attīstīts HIV profilaksas kabinetu punktu, ja kaitēja mazināšanas programmu tīklojums. Par grūtniecēm tātad jau pieminēju. Pagājušais gads gan ir samazinājušās šīs HIV pozitīvo grūtnieču dzemdētāju skaits, gan arī, kas ir sasaistīts arī ar kopējo dzemdību skaitu noteikti, taču laba prognoze ir tā, ka tomēr ir šis kritums arī tātad pozitīviem bērniņiem. Tālāk par to, kā tad reāli cilvēkam jārīkojas, ja viņš grib noskaidrot savu HIV statusu. Tas ir jautājums, ar ko mēs diezgan sen jau mūsu biedrību nodarbojas. Pirmā viena no akcijām, kas bija kampaņām, bija veids HIV testu reizi gadā, un pie šīs te arī rekomendācijas mēs stingri pieturamies. Tātad HIV testu var veikt divējādi. Visos gadījumās tas ir jāapstiprina laboratorijā. Pirmais tātad veids ir doties uz jebkuru laboratoriju ar nosūtījumu, arī var iet bez nosūtījumu un nodot asimts no vēnas. Jā, šajās asimnīs tiks atrastas HIV antivielas, ir arī izmantojot antigēnu noteikts, ka kaut kas no šīm lietām asimnīs atrodas, tad laboratorija pati aizsūtīs asimnis uz referents laboratoriju, kas ir Latvijas infektoloģijas centrā, un ja šī diagnoza apstiprināsies, tad cilvēks saņems atbildi vai ne caur ārstu, kas viņi ir nosūtījis, vai ne caur laboratoriju. Šis ir pārsvarā maksas pakalpojums, jā, ar nosūtījumu te lētāk, ja bez nosūtījumu, tad jāmaksā pašam vairāk. Bet tas, ko mēs aicinām izmantot, un kas ir patiesībā nevienmēr pilnībā izmantots, ir šie te HIV profilaksas kabinēti. HIV profilaksas punktu Latvijā ir vairāk kā 20 jau šobrīd, un šie te punkti, Izmeklējums veids bez maksas, lietojot vienkāršu ekspresu testu no pirksta, tātad asiņas no pirksta 20 minūšu laikā ir sākotnējais rezultāts. Ja šis rezultāts uzrāda negatīvu vai vienalga, arī tad cilvēks saņem konsultāciju, jo laikam tas vērtīgākais no šiem ekspresu testiem un HIV profilaksas kabinetiem ir tas, ka Ārsniecības personas, kas strādā arī šajos kabinetos, spēj nodrošināt pilnvērtīgu un, es teikšu, arī tik garu, cik nepieciešams sarunu pirms testu un pēc testu ar cilvēku. Ja šis tests ir reaktīvs, ja pozitīvs, teiksim, tad jebkurā gadījumā arī tā patās, kā ar iepriekš minēto, šis tests ir jāapstiprina laboratorijā. Te tāds attāls no slimību profilaksas kontroles centra mājas lapas, kur par katru no šiem te punktiem ne tikai Rīgā, bet arī citās pilsētās ir pilnīga informācija. Uzējot uz šo te atzīmīti var redzēt gan darba laikus, gan strādājot šo teiksim punktu adreses un visa informācija šeit ir iegūstama. Ja uz punktos pārsvarā agrāk vēsturiski tika strādāts tikai ar narkotiku lietotājiem, bet šobrīd man šķiet jau visi punkti ir atvērti jau kuram cilvēkam. 
Ko tad jāsniedz, jo pieminēja konsultācijas, ir, ir tādi Hugh Profilaks kabinetu, kur arī ir psihologs, sociālais darbinieks, piemēram, pat Rīgā dialogā tādi ir. Mūsu kabinetā ir medicīnas darbinieks un arī sniedzam faktiski psiholoģisko atbalstu. Ir ekspres diagnostika ne tikai uz HIV infekciju, bet arī hepatītu B, hepatītu C un zifilisu. Tātad šo te ekspres testu klāstu nodrošina slimību profilaks kontrols centrs, un tie ir validēti pārbaudīti ekspres testi, kurus piegādā valsts mūsu biedrībām un pašvaldību organizācijām. Medicīnas preces tātad ir šeit dažādas, gan dezinfekcijas līdzekļa, gan arī šeit jau pieminētie kondomi vai prezervatīvi, kuru lietošana ir ļoti svarīga, lai izsargātos no HIV infekcijas. Un tāpat dažādi informatīvi materiāli. Ja runā par mūsu testpunktu Rīgā, tad kopš pagājušā gada novembra mums ir divas adreses, strādājam gan Stabu ielā, kas ir LGBT House Rīga, un tās ir otrdienas, otrdienu vakar no 5 līdz 9, un strādājam arī šobrīd jau trīs dienas, nedēļ, trīs dienas nedēļā pēc Covid ārkārtējās situācijas nedaudz pārvarēšanas, un tā, tā ir mērķi liela. Pagājušais gads mums ir bijis ļoti ražens, mēs esam kopā 1358 apmeklētāji ir bijuši pie mūsu punktos, gan arī izbraukumos, jo arī tādos mēs dodamies gan uz kūtmītnēm, gan, gan pie studentiem uz universitātēm. Esam strādājuši arī festivālā lampa, dažādās tirzniecības vietās, veikalā Alfa, piemēram, un arī centrālajā dzelzceļa stacijā, kur te ir iepriekšējā gada tātad attēli. Tas ir tas, ko mēs darām un kā mēs mēģinām cilvēkus mudināt uz HIV testu, un es gribu teikt, ka noteikti šī te attieksme pret HIV testu ir pozitīvi mainījusies, jo cilvēki stāv rindā, lai veiktu HIV testu. Un tā agrāk pirms gadiem pieciem nekad nav bijis. Es domāju, ka tas ir tomēr savu veidu panākums, ka mēs esam mainījuši savus stereotipus un mēs esam ar mieru veikt HIV testus arī tātad šādā ikdienas laikā. Te nedaudz par to, kā, kā teiksim, HIV profilaks punktu, kas nav ārstniecības iestādes, sadarbojas tālāk ar Latvijas infektologiem, ar Latvijas infektoloģijas centru. Tas ir sarežģīts varbūt algoritmas uzīmēts, bet tom ir tāda, ka no mūsu punkta mēs mēģinām cilvēku uzreiz nomotavēt, doties uz infektoloģijas centru vai pie infektologiem un uzsākt šo te ārstēšanu. Protams, ir vispirms nepieciešams diagnozes apstiprinājums, kas ir pa vidu, bet ja cilvēks ir pozitīvs, tad, tad viņa ceļš ir doties uz veselības aprūpi. Un mans pieminētājs par šo te stāvēšanu rindā pēc izmeklējumu uz HIV no apliecinājums ir šajā te attēlā. Mēs esam ieguvuši, man liekas, ka ļoti tādu pozitīvu līkni, Šie zilie ir tātad tie pārējie cilvēki, kas ir ārpus skrīnīga grūtniecēm, ārpus ieslodzītījiem un ārpus donoriem. Tad zilā līknīte rāda, ka zilais, zilie stabiņi rāda, ka šie te pārējie, ja, nu, tie cilvēki, kas ir vienkārši no ielas, teiksim, viņi vēc hilt testus vairāk nekā iepriekšējos gadus, un tas, protams, ir tāds ļoti, Domāju, ka labs sasniegums Latvijā, ja tam ņemot vērā to, ka jauno gadījumu skaits ir samazinājies. Un kopsavalkot manu prezentāciju un varbūt pievēršoties tādām, tādām svarīgākām lietām, kas man ir tādas, ko es domāju, ka varētu attīstīt tālākajās diskusijās, ir, protams, apzināties to, ka Latvijā 
HIV situācija ir ļoti slikta, joprojām neskatoties, ka pēdējos divus gadus tā uzlabojas. Tā ir augstākā Baltijā, domājams arī Eiropā, un pēdējā data, protams, par pagājušo gadu Eiropai vēl nav. Prevalējošā izplatības forma ir seksuālā transmisija. Un te nu, jāsaka tā lieto prezervatīvu un pārbaudies, jo HIV infekcija skar ikvienu, HIV infekcija tātad nešķiro ne jaunāku, ne vecāku, mums ir gan jaunieši bērni, kas inficējas, gan arī šie pusmūras cilvēki pēc 50, pēc 70 gadiem. Un tas, ka vidējais inficēto cilvēku vecums palielinās, nu, tas ir, protams, arī sasaistīts ar sabiedrības novecošanu. Un problēma, kas man ļoti sāp, un es domāju, sāp visiem mediķiem, ir tas, ka Latvijā joprojām ir gadu tomēr dzimšie pa HIV pozitīvie bērniņi. Un tā būtu lietu, kur droši vien arī varētu šodienas diskusijās mēģināt šo te, no šī perspektīva skatīties uz jautājumu. Reizi gadā HIL testu to runājām un teicām un pēc iespējas agrīm, jo te sasaucas tieši ar aizstāstīto par to, ka Latvijā es pat tā, mēs esam analizējuši, mums pat sanāca ir 70% dažu gadu, kad ir veikta šī vēlīnā diagnosticēšana. Tā kā šis 50 un uz augšu procents ir spēkā noteikti, un šis procents ir jāpazemina. Un jā, un ārstēšana, protams, ir visefektīvākā profilaksa, nevēl tieši šis te test and treat strateģija ieviests, un neatkarīgi šobrīd no CD šūnu skaits, tā ir pieejama ik vienam cilvēkam Latvijā. Ar šo te es arī beidzu, šeit ir kontakti mūsu testpunktam, uz kuru aicinām pieteikties veikt šo te bezmaksas testu. Jāpiesakās noteikti šobrīd, jo ir Covid laiks, mēs arī strādājam un ievērojot visas piesardzības līdzekļus un arī distancēšanos. Tā kā nāciet un snieksim palīdzību. Yeah, Paldies. Thank you. Thank you, Inga. So I will use uh, two languages. <laughs> so first of all, uh, thanks a lot once again. So any questions? I uh, wrote down like one question from Facebook, but we'll answer. Uh, we'll ask it a little bit later. So the first hand goes to Zoom call participants. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> I will I will start this is a suction. It says double shogun a lot is here Angles. I will I will Okay. Ah, okay, perfect. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot. So um yeah, so you uh, first of all that they were they were asking is that uh is there any stigma uh for the patients, uh HIV positive patients to receive, you know, just a daily healthcare care when when they come into the hospital, are there any challenges, you know? Are there any stigma also among the medical specialists? You know, if they come into polyclinics or the same pregnant pregnant women, HIV positive, what's the, you know, yeah, what's the problem there? Uh, unfortunately, yes, uh, stigma exists and we have uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, cases when people are reported that uh, some of doctor refused, for example, pregnant women uh, to, to have in, in, in his... Uh, a patient's uh, list and yeah, stigma exists and it depends from specialists. If, uh, the special, if a specialist has before some case of HIV infection, I think that he is a little bit changing, but not all people, not all professionals are no uh, without stigma. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the second question was the the following. So uh, yeah, you told that, yeah, the testing is one of the, 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 the greatest mechanisms that we have right now to, to fight HIV uh, pandemics in the society. But uh, can you elaborate? So it, it doesn't work like, like you know, uh, someone had unprotected sex, as an example, or any other risk factor. If he got tested the next day, he will have a negative results. Am I right? So just yeah, to, you know, 
Of course, but uh, if he is coming, it's very good because we have possibility to talk with him and motivate to come after and motivate not to use, not, not to, uh, to, to make sex without condom in this uh, unclear period and of course in future also. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, just to you know, just to just to follow up also with a, I think with a, with a positive note as well. So you you mentioned about pregnant women and uh, the ones who are using medication on a regular basis can have uh, can have children and can yeah. have HIV negative yeah. children. Yeah. So yeah. Once, once again, referring to the stigma mm -hmm. and uh, stereotypes. Yeah, if if the pregnant woman is uh, on treatments and uh, child uh, then. Here, a uh, newborn will be 99%. He will be uh, healthy without HIV, and it depends from only from mother. And we have to to talk with mothers that they have to to get medication. Um, by the way, you mentioned um, like you showed how in 2001 the amount of um, HIV positive people skyrocketed. Um, what, what exactly, so you mentioned um, a lot of um, like drugs, like needle, needle sort of the drugs and um, it was transmitted that way. Uh, can you elaborate on what happened? Like um, why did the drug abuse increase, I suppose? Mm -hmm. Because border uh, were opened and heroin is coming very uh, quickly in Latvia. It wasn't before, and that was a changing period. And why so so rapidly spread, spreading? Because uh, you know, uh, drug users they are sharing needles and syringes. For example, together ten people or or five people, and it depends. It, it depends if in this uh, uh, group is somebody who has HIV infection, then he can infect it in the one time 10 or five people. And it's not the same than in sexual transmission when only one can infect it to the other one. And that is why, uh, yeah, two reasons. When is, uh, one is that uh, heroin is coming after other drugs are also crossing borders uh, and uh, people are infected each other by using uh, the same needles and syringes and only in in the end of 90s it was in 97 uh, there were started the first H, the first needle exchange program after only it was in beginning in 2000 started first methadone programs and it was uh, too late for uh, prevent this very very high um, amount of new cases for in drug users population awesome thanks maybe yeah maybe maybe another another question from my side and i'll pass to to the audience and uh and the uh, final words so um uh you, you mentioned about so you mentioned about the stigmatization stereotypes of the, both the lectures were also centered about this topic so uh can you can you can you it's uh, how you know once there is a person who thinks, oh, you know, I have, I have a risk of HIV or he's HIV positive. So basically, what, what are the challenges then for him? What is the next step he should perform? Meaning that, you know, he is, um, it is hard for him just to go outside for some kind of, you know, society or hospital and talk with a doctor or any other like, psychologist uh, about this topic. So are there any other mechanisms how they can, you know, uh, do this without any, any personalization? Uh, many people are using uh, this uh, NGO sector, and people are coming to test points also. And we are we are uh, very happy that they are coming just for talk. And uh, I recommend just to come to to our checkpoint or other sites where are open, free free of charge, and just just for talk. Firstly, if um, we would m motivate people that uh, there is possible also make this uh, rapid testing, then it's, it's one step forward. And after uh, he can come to us because we, our checkpoint has a lot of people who 
uh, uh, come once and the second time and they follow all the time uh, medical uh, staff who is working here. We have uh, a few of them, but uh, somebody is just changing only one and, and is asking when he or she is working. So. Yeah, thank you Inga so much. So uh, any more questions coming from the Zoom audience? So I'll ask two from Facebook, so. Hi. Uh, oh, sorry. You go ahead. You go first. You go. Oh, okay. Um, I think I'll uh, reintroduce myself. Uh, so I'm the sixth year medical student in the University of Latvia. Uh, my name is Jana, and uh, my question is regards the registry you have mentioned. Uh, so you said there's a new registry for HIV patients. Is this some kind of registry where you later talk to that people, connect to them uh, and do some kind of follow up or you just like uh, write down, oh, this person had the uh, HIV positive test at that age. What does uh, this register being used for? That's the question. Uh, perhaps about this register, I will, will comment better because she should use this register. I am just uh, observer i know that this register was uh, uh, rebuilt because uh, yeah for, for the reason that um, if uh, somebody is hiv infected that uh, data of of his uh, this person can be uh, com uh, completed and uh, added uh, by doctors uh, all the time. Before we have statistic register, we just have a case, uh, for example, that he, he is man and uh, he has uh, diagnosed on, for example, months ago and no more information. Um, no, um, mostly not about uh, infectious uh, transmission way um, they missed very important part for treatment as i understand that this register is uh, available to put some data also after um, being re registered but i can can add if i am not right i yeah you can say yes, thank you um, this register is meant for uh, clinicians and uh, we we put their ongoing information on the patient. So as Inga mentioned, there is this epidemiologic data on transmission mode, um, and uh, but there also is um, clinical um, clinical aspects as uh, CD4 count, viral load, uh, medications the patient is on uh, when in, when they were started, maybe if they were switched, uh, and etc. But the problem with this is that uh, uh, we should uh, um, enter data manually. So <laughs> this is another challenge. So again, it's um, time consuming and um, actually for better results and uh, more data uh, in uh, ideal world, uh, it uh, should be as uh, all the data are um, connected with uh, laboratories where those um, parameters are performed uh, and uh, they uh, are uploaded automatically. So, but yes, it's uh, meant for clinicians, epidemiologists, and uh, then uh, we have all the ongoing information on the patient. Of course, it uh, helps on management of patients because uh, we can see one person, how uh, his clinical uh, and treatment state uh, develops. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Aya. There was uh, one more question coming from the... Hi, yeah. Um, my name is Natalie. I am a, also a medical student at um, LU. Uh, I'm from South Africa and I've done work with HIV in South Africa. In South Africa, it's about 13% of the population is, has HIV. So it's, it's quite a, a, maybe a different type of thing. But it's just kind of with, with stigma and what I've realized about um, in South Africa, it's very much made to be more of a common place where people talk about HIV because it's such an issue. But it also means that at universities, there are condoms everywhere. They have in the bathroom, not everywhere. Um, and they have testing points often that come to the university and test people. And it's, 
And I think that that does a lot for stigma. And um, we've tried to organize, I've tried to organize World AIDS Days at the University of Latvia. And what I've noticed is there's just this um, sort of a resistance in, in maybe talking about it or having this, um, this access to things like condoms at the university. And I really feel like if we change things at the university, because it's obviously when, you know, sexually active students and whatever, I just feel like there is such a good opportunity at universities to deal with kind of stigma going in, into the world. And so it's, it's not so much of a question, but more of a, I think Belt HIV did organize some testing points for the World AIDS Day. And I think it was such a great opportunity for people who haven't been tested to get tested. In South Africa, it's a like common place to get tested every year, whether you're sexually active or not, or whatever, it's just like such a common place. And I really feel like there's opportunity at the University of Latvia to make, to make something like that more commonplace and therefore, you know, impacting stigma. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing uh, your experience. It's, I think it's very valuable. Also, I, I hope that you will stay for the workshop part to work with the, with the students from different faculties all together. So can I can I comment sure. also? Uh, thank you for this very good comment, and uh, I can say that we ha we did it. We did it uh, three years. We are uh, we have uh, worked uh, and uh, consult and tested in uh, Latvia University. It was up to three years ago in Stradinsk University, in Yalgova uh, Technicum also, uh, we, we, ha we had it. But uh, of course, this is uh, a very uh, ongoing work for, and we will continue it because, for example, last year in one day, we had 83 uh, tests in, uh, in Stradinsk University, what, what, what is quite enough for, for, for this yeah, small country. So I can say that stigma, yeah, it depends from people who organize because we have, um, we, we, we need some organizers from university side also. If you are interested that we will collaborate, of course, in this year, we are interested to go to universities. So thanks. That's great. And I was just going to say, I think there was some testing done last year for World AIDS Day and the numbers were a huge amount of people were interested mm -hmm. because they wouldn't usually go to a testing point, but because it was so available. So thank you. And I think that that's a great thing moving forward. Thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Once again, Inga, thanks a lot for all the questions. So, uh, yeah, so I will pass the word to, <laughs> to myself. So I, we, we, we thought we would have another speaker, but yeah, fortunately, the, 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 another pandemic also make you know, changes into the plans. So uh, I, will, I, will, I will share my screen. And uh, once again, yes, so. Um, yeah, so how, hi, once again, so my name is Emil, so I have a couple of hats to wear. So one, one of this is, is an academic one. So I am a PhD student at the Faculty of Computing University of Latvia. So and uh, also leading the academic courses and, uh, and projects with, uh, with medical students and IT students um, for applied research and, uh, and uh, industry products. And the same, uh, the, same, the same thing I do in the, in the industrial level in the company for Genesis. So uh, yeah, so I will give a brief, you know, I will try to uh, give a brief um, case showcases and, uh, and uh, elaborate a little bit more on the trends in tech. But, you know, in, since it's a huge topic and we can speak about this, you know, long, long time, um, I will try to put this somehow, you know, in relation to the challenges that were outlined before on the stigma, the stereotypes, you know, the, the whole uh, trust building uh, with, the, with the help of the interfaces and what challenges they are and what, what, what can be used. So you can use this as, a, you know, as another uh, helping point for the, for the workshop part. So yeah, so uh, you know, first of all, we need to understand why we why we speak about tech computers. 
So when um, why, why do we want to actually you know use them also for fight the pandemics and uh, and, and related challenges? So uh, as you see on the screen here, so this uh, you know two two gentlemen, one uh, a little bit more hipsterish, other is a just a guy with a scooter. Basically, um, it also relates to computer world. So basically, we will be speaking about computers because of and we're using them because we are would like to automate uh, iterative operations and not only automate but also uh, based on the input, we would like to provide some kind of output. So basically, based on the data or metrics that we uh put in, inside of a computer system we would like to get something out so we'd like to make the the process uh robust without you know additional uh power of, of men and in this case speaking of calculations this is something we cannot perform on the same level as computers are and uh why we're speaking about you know the variety of different applications there's uh, one of the factor was size okay this one is a new computer as well computerized system but you know we, we came all all across from you know from a huge uh computer boxes up to the ceiling uh, ending up with you know something small and this one is uh, called smart dust which is uh, which was de was developed back in uh, Michigan uh, Tech University uh, which is called uh, Michigan micro mode basically a computer that can sense the, the environment around it uh, make perform actions like calculations and also uh, do something that can create an output in the size of one cubic millimeter. And, uh, which is quite impressive, I think. And this one is a one dime coin. Another another factor is actually how we how we talk with computers, computerized systems. And in this case, um, it's quite interesting that we went from you know from uh, from up to the lower levels. This is not the lowest one. Lower levels of mathematic operations or working you know with bits and pieces to create uh, uh, an algorithm, a logic how to how computers should perform up to something very high level and very intuitive for you know for uh, just just the society like that and i, I most probably most probably you've seen uh, uh this kind of examples uh before this this thing is called scratch so this is a kitty cat that basically you you, you create blocks and pieces to to program and uh, make the cat do the stuff like i don't know change the costumes in this case uh walk dance and, and do other stuff and with the same principle, you can also work with uh, with the sensor systems and other computer systems and program them to do uh, to do the stuff you would like to. So yeah, we, will, we why why we're touching the computerized systems is another thing is that we um, we taught computers to sense not in the relation of you know this cute creature which is a mole with the testicles uh, that he sends the world he sends the food he sends his house where he lives, where should he should go or run to. But um, actually we, we taught computers and design computers to, to sense the different metrics around us, uh, starting from, uh, from a sensors for, for the nature, uh, nature or environment uh, science, such as temperature, humidity, um, you know, seismic activity, et cetera, ending up with a user input and uh, you know, using humans as a sensors in, inbound with a digitized system that we'll, we'll see a little bit later. And yeah, this all forms the, you know, the smart world concept and which is for sure is applicable to the healthcare sphere. And I will elaborate on a couple of case studies a little bit later on. Uh, another part of why we speak about this is if we look at on ourselves, at ourselves now, so, you know, my hands, like I see the skin or flesh, uh, but in, in the case of a computer, uh, computer set mind, uh, I can perceive the body as a source of a big data. So we, we can harvest, we can, we can analyze, a, tons of different metrics starting up with you know with a with a with a yearly checkups or radiological examinations ending up with you know with a with a perspective of real world data gathering from a you know daily activity or any other inputs and imagine if we have an opportunity to to put this all together and uh, make the sense out of that which we will refer a little bit later so yeah we'll be speaking about the connected health concept but let's dive into some of the some of the cases um so in case later I'll, I'll refer to this one later um so uh one of the examples for sure is using the you know if we if we talk about epidemics which is not directly hiv but the ep epidemic level uh there are great applications how you know how the con consumer wearables are used for community-based research and actually uh, perceiving anyone any user who has smart watches or any you know smart trains 
smart glasses, whatever smart device as a, as a sensor node, as a, basically as a, as, a, as a unit where we can take some of the, some of the science, analyze them all together and uh, look on the world as a sort of a mi microscope. So basically in order to provide trends, analyze the risks, for the same thing as the managing epidemics. And if you, if, you, if you go to the web right now, you will see a ton of different articles also referring to COVID-19 for sure, as an example. Um, I, won't be, I won't be diving too much into the, you know, to, to the AI or uh, deep learning part. We'll mostly be speaking now about uh, the business to consumer or basically user level interaction on the next, in the next slides. But just to refer to that one, Everyone, most probably, I see uh, on this from a faculty of computer who's working on the uh, AI application. <laughs> so, uh, but for others, you know, uh, most probably all of you heard about artificial intelligence or you know deep lear uh, deep learning or uh, neural networks to that can perform tremendous amount of operations, learn and you know become smart and eventually maybe super intelligence and in in in, in some day. But basically, this is a, this is one of the examples of a deep learning that enables rapid identification of the inhibitors, and basically, which is used for uh, drug discovery, so for uh, target identification and molecule generation, which is basically was published back in Nature uh, in 2019 uh, by the company called in Silicon Medicine together with Novartis. So basically, they used they used the power of uh, deep neural networks to basically. Um, have a set of targets they need to they need to fight or address with the, with the, with the drug molecules and perform different molecule structures in order to propose uh, the candidate drug candidates that were tested in vivo and uh, were uh, were sent to preclinical trials but one of the things here is that uh, we will be speaking about this user aspect so why how does it match and why it is also very important to speak about that because all of this, you know, crazy smart stuff is relates uh, also on the community level. So how community is, where the community is ready to participate in, uh, in uh, research activities like that, because the, the whole, all of the systems are based on data and not only in retrospective data that can be, you know, ingested or parsed from EHR systems, from the hospitals or registries as were outlined as an example from previous lectures, but also from a society level, each of one of us uh, who can basically through the digital interfaces participate and generate real world data or prospective data, insight information that will be trem of tremendous use in this kind of applications to also, you know, um, hope, hopefully someday uh, creating drug candidates for also fighting HIV. Uh, but yeah, let, let's tackle on the, on, the, on the human or society level. So one of the, you know, one of the great examples is uh, in a cardiovascular disease, which is for sure not, not the HIV topic, but uh, I think you can refer to this kind of cases and examples in, in the workshop part. It's called cardiogram. So as you see on the slide, it's like the, the, the slogan is, what's your heart telling you? So uh, what do they do? They have a simple app and they pair with a Fitbit uh, or uh, Apple Watch and uh, basically allow you not only to receive quite an interesting insight, you know, how you felt during Microsoft Skype, uh, Microsoft Skype interview or now during the Zoom call, how do I felt, you know, whether I was overreacting or, you know, I had, you know, <laughs> I need to work on my, on my, uh, on coming down during the talk but also to um, consent and proactively participate in uh, community-driven research. So the data that comes there, it also goes onto the community uh, server site where scientists performing the operations and analytics to fight cardiovascular disease together. So uh, with this initiative by University of South California, they gathered more than 300,000 uh, uh, users who are actually sharing the cardiovascular metrics with the research groups which is quite interesting. And this is the, the result of that. It's called eHeart study, which is basically their main aim is to, you know, to fight and contribute uh, with every bit of data, which brings us, the community, closer to saving lives in, in the case of cardiovascular disease. But imagine how this can be used for other diseases as well. If you go to hiv.gov, which is quite interesting, I, I did the search yesterday. They had uh, around, yeah, they had 17 blog posts about using digital tools for, um, for uh, the um, promote aw awareness and uh, basically talking with uh, with people and different stakeholders about HIV and the risks, 
and how you need to how you need to perceive and perform, uh, which are mainly if you see here, mainly are related to the digital uh, media or social media or you know the social networks that you most commonly using during everyday life. But uh, we will be referring to you know a little bit of other uh, interfaces, you know, using like techie stuff for uh, for uh, for approaching the diseases, so you can use them or maybe you know pivot the idea to the to the HIV prevention stuff. One of the examples for sure you, you've seen and heard, maybe some of you try it, is, uh, is VR or AR or you know extended reality, mixed reality uh, applications, and uh, which is quite interesting. You know how this can be um, you know related related to the to the prevention. For sure, you've seen the, the the dozens of different applications for VR education, and you know the 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 3D or uh, VR environment can be used for putting people into inside of simulations and give them the impression of you know how they perform and how they will act uh, under certain circumstances. But it was an interesting example is this one. I don't know how many of you use this one. This is called Big Screen TV, which is basically an app where any one of you who has a VR set can basically create a, a room to watch movies together. How cool is that? But actually what's interesting, there are a couple of, a couple of articles now stating that the, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, users are not watching movies together, but conducting psychological counseling sessions together. And why so? One of the, one of the reasons why, why they do that and in, in, you know, referring to the stigma and, uh, and the stereotypes and, uh, and, uh, and these challenges to, to speak out loud about this topic was that they all use anonymized avatars. And when you join the public room, you can, you know, open, open your heart and, and speak honestly with just, you know, an animated avatar in front of you. But, you know, speaking, speaking from a from person for sure, which, uh, which is a, quite an interesting example how, you know, the, just the social platform is also used for, for, for discussing this kind of topics, which are, you know, sometimes under uh, stigma in the society. Another part for sure is the chatbots. Yeah. So, um, you know, this, this, not a little boy, but this kind of stuff, you know, that most of you for sure maybe use this in your mobile phone, such as Siri or, you know, Google voice assistants, et cetera, to automate your house or to automate the calls or, you know, SMS or just checking the weather or uh, traffic in, in, in your city after work. But another example is for sure in the healthcare sphere. And uh, one, of the, one of the great examples is not only, you know, asking or answering the stuff, but uh, two of these, one of the one of the management medication, this one is an Amazon Alexa example, when basically uh, people who are prescribed a certain medication, they can set up um, the the body at their house or at their mobile phone or in the car, basically uh, registering the, the the drug that you're using, and uh, Alexa will automatically remind you and also perform you know the the ordering for the refill of your prescribed drugs for sure the, the, this works in the, in the in the us now but, but but imagine that you can everyone can basically you know use such as a voice assistant just for reminding myself of uh, the stuff i really need to do and in this case it can be medications that which are prescribed uh, the second of all, which is quite interesting, is not only about the medication reminding this stuff, but the, the use uh, with a, the, the pilot with the Boston Children's Hospital, where they use the, the, the voice assistant for helping the, uh, the parents uh, to overcome and to basically to perform good during, during the post-operative period after heart surgery for the children. So once they go home, uh, Alexa sets up the, the routine, like 14 days or 21 day, you know, depending on the condition for sure, and reminds every morning, if you say, good morning, Alexa, uh, she says, you know, this is the second day after the surgery, you should do that, you should do this, there might be questions, please ask them, et cetera, et cetera, creating this kind of conversation without, you know, without going out of, outside of your house, which means that, you know, uh, you can create the, the, the first step of uh, you know building trust and, and communication uh, without going you know anywhere outside your own uh, comfort territory. The another example which is quite interesting and for sure you everyone you, you used at some point of time any messengers the chatbots are there, and uh, this one example is I think it's quite good referring to the to the HIV topic and the stigma and the and the and the, and the stereotypes building 
This is called Askmaya, which was built by Bayer in uh, in Malaysia. The main the main uh, aim of this um, of this chatbot was to create uh, create a conversation body for women in in this case an Islamic country to to guide and to talk about uh, oral contraceptives. Uh, why this is a problem? Because there is uh there are cultural and uh, religious differences meaning that the women there there was a problem that women there were overdosing or you know not using them correctly or using them too late uh which you know which harms the 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 state of health of the of the of the of the, of the females in this case so basically they created an app which uh gained a lot of trust among women actually and um, to both remind on the on the pill intake and also guide you know how to behave, what to do, what type of medicaments to, to choose at what point of time, and you know what if I miss the pill, what should I do? Not you should not drink you know two or three or four pills. You know uh, depends on how much you how much you missed for sure. So this is why you have this body, which is uh, an avatar and the chatbot system where you also don't show your face and you can you can speak honestly. And this thing built trust there in the region. Another topic where we were talking about the GPs and other stuff is, uh, you know, the risk calculators. And there are tons and tons of different risk calculators. If you go to the, you know, to the major hospital network, like um, Mayo Clinic as an example, they have the uh, integrated health risk calculators and guidance reports uh, set on, on the website. And this is just an example of a simple diabetes risk calculator. Basically, this can be used both for the GPs or doctors or patients both to perform the risk assessment to understand whether, aha, uh -huh, you know, uh, I had this and that, I feel like this, should I, you know, think about going to, to test myself? Should I think about going to my GP or, you know, perform any other related actions? And the same comes on the other side of the bridge, which are medical professionals, because this is not about, you know, the, it's not so much about the education level, other stuff, basically the limited resources the, the healthcare professionals have uh, during, you know, the, the mass best amount of patients coming and you know once you have 15 20 minutes visit it's quite hard to you know to ask about everything also maybe including the, the hiv test in this case so uh, imagine that you know gathering the this kind of metrics the phenotypic metrics or you know lifestyle surveys from the patient cohorts will be uh will be helping to do the patient triage in the real time so before the patients are coming you already can see the risk factors or risk modules outlining the certain patient and can you know ask him uh, the questions that are personalized to the, to the person in this case. So, yeah, so, you know, uh, I, I look on the, I look on the, on the, on the, on the time. So basically uh, we were, we, we live in a world of data. So this, this, all of the part is all is related to the data metric that we harvest that we gather and we uh, use. Uh, but basically if, if I move this one, you will see that, you know, by, by 2025 we will will create on a daily basis 463 exabytes of data if you if you look here it's like tremendous amount of bytes it's like a lot of a lot of information creating this you know this so-called ocean of information <laughs> wait a sec ocean of information and like this am i right so different dots uh, all around the uh, the computer program on in this case you know the dots on the screen and we should understand how to connect them so this is one of the challenges in the technological world so not only to gather data and build the trust on the digital level but you know once you harvested the metrics once you establish the communication and you start gathering information how do you how do you know what matters the most in a certain period of time how do you connect these dots to have something like that in the end of the day so when uh, we will speak about the uh, wait a sec technical thing yeah so uh when you sp when we speak about this tremendous amount of data we also speak about the noise and not the noise you know the mc the you know the the rap singer from uh, uh coming to who was supposed to come in may this year uh to riga but the noise in the data and the noise in the value of information and precision of information where we need to basically where we need to have uh, and approaches and multidisciplinary approaches where we should sit down all together and understand what matters the most. And in order, yeah, basically in order to finish this one with a, one of the challenges is that I, I extracted this from a TED talk, which um, basically stated the following. So the, 
the the father uh, of the future asks his child of the, of the future so basically hey um can i ask you one question if you answer correctly i will you know i will buy you iphone 30 or 35 or 25 what's whatsoever will be there uh he's like, okay so uh and uh in this in this uh in this point he asked okay son or daughter who is beethoven so the child you know just smiles widely and says okay hey siri alexa hey cortana uh or any other you know <laughs> smart assistant who is beethoven and what, what he receives in the end of the day's output is the beethoven who is the composer the famous one and the beethoven who's a movie star so the child you know sits and thinks oh my god who should i choose in this case so this is about you know choosing the right uh understanding what is the right value of the information we gather at the right point to help the ones who who need this the most and to understand how we how we behave and perform in this point of time so yeah so um i sh will stop the screen sharing so i hope you all heard me first of all <laughs> because my 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 uh my earphones are dying but nevertheless uh any questions so far on on this thing and uh yeah, I will be gladly uh, elaborating on the points I've outlined during the talk. I, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> thanks for the presentation, but also um, thanks for talking about the, the issue of um, providing some anonymity for people. Um, you know, especially when we're talking about uh, a subject that people are very sensitive about stereotyping and stigma. I think that's a, an important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, thank you, Shale. I think it's very, very important. And I think this is, you know, both a challenge in the digital space to create this trust and, you know, to, um, to also build privacy. Uh, not, you know, because we all, we all live in the internet and this is a quite a cool kind of an open space, uh, both fortunate and unfortunate. But uh, from another part, I see great, great potential, you know, starting from individual level and up with societal level. I think one of the one of the topics I, I, I missed and I missed the slide is uh, when, uh, when the Northwestern University of the U.S., they used Twitter data. They scraped Twitter for the flu outbreak. And it was oh. quite interesting to see this in real time because, you know, what people are doing when they're using social network proactively, they say, oh, you know, I have. I'm going home, you know, I don't feel well, or, you know, hashtag flu or hashtag temperature or hashtag, I don't know what they drink, like Teraflu or any other related drug. And once they parse this data, they put this on the map and they try to, you know, using also geographical and geolocation, they put the pinpoints and understand how the, you know, how the virus can outspread, at wow. least theoretically. That's really cool. Which is quite interesting, I think, yeah. But yeah, but thanks a lot for the comment. <laughs> yeah, any any questions so far, or you know, we will move to another part. Um, I wanted to ask about disruptive technologies. Um, do wh what's your what's your take on them? Um, should um, we try to focus more on improving what currently works, or rather um, focus on, for example, creating a completely new sort of approach? Okay, I, I won't be, you know, any anything uh, very new to say this, but I think we shouldn't, we should stop doing tech for, you know, like we should, we should stop being tech driven only, because this is one of the challenges I think in a, in a, some of the cases when we just think about, you know, the technological outbreak or moving the technology forward, but we should, uh, we should think about interdisciplinary approach more and more. So we should, we should use the tech as a screwdriver of a 21st century. So, you know, and by this, I mean that both the educational level, everyone should know that the screwdriver is meant, you know, to screw in the, <laughs> the stuff to make, you know, the, the furniture or to make, you know, the, your room looks good, look good and, and, and cool. Uh, but not anyone should for sure screw this. So uh, I think we should use the same approach, you know, for the, for the tech as a, as a tool and we should sit down uh, the same way we will sit down together and, and talk about the app application and perform this as a tool, problem solving. Okay, so I think we don't have any questions left. <laughs> so yeah, I will, I will, I will, uh, so we'll do the following. So uh, thanks a lot for the lecture part once again. Thanks a lot.
So what we do right now, so we have uh, participants here among uh, the Zoom, yeah, Zoom participants. So uh, let's let's do the following. So uh, let's do a round of a uh, quick round of introductions. So I, I, I suppose that we can do it the, the, the following way. So basically, um, you know, let, let's have the, you know, three points there. So what's your name, uh, who you are, so where you come from, uh, what's your background, and, uh, you know, you, your, your uh, uh, top one to three uh, key takeouts, takeaways from, uh, from the lecture part. And what do you personally see, you know, as a, as a challenge to be tackled? Yes. Hey. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, let, let's do the following. Let's do the round of introduction. Kasper, can you can you lead this? So uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. So it was um, my name, where am I from, and um, one to three key takeaways. Um, so my name is Kaspar Kaspar Zaglidis, and I'm a um, I'm the administrator of PF Lab, and I'm also a, um, the a student, a bachelor student of um, computer science here at the University of Latvia. Um, my main takeaway is, is um, like for me, I had the vibe that the biggest problem is there is a lack of certainty. There is a lack of um, knowledge and um, like um, there are some like, yeah, I have the feeling that there are uh, many points that aren't really well connected. So, for example, um, as it was the case with, um, for example, um, like not being a lot of information about the statistics or causes of HIV in Latvia, as mentioned by Inga, and um, um, stuff like that. And I think um, this is where that can really help and more understand these things more. But um, before I give the name to the next person, I'll notify you that I'm um, shutting off the live stream. Yeah. Thanks everybody for joining there, for joining here online and on Facebook. And um, back to you, members. Yeah. So uh, let let's do it the following way. You know, the there is a there is a list of participants here. So I 